Fire Brigade. Yeah, hello. Hi, in the fire, flat 16 Greenfield Tower. Sorry, your fire where? The flat 16 Greenfield Tower. The fire brigade are on their way. Are you outside? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm outside. So the 999 operator taking another call just before 1am on the 14th of June 2017. This may have seemed urgent, but routine. This caller, however, was alerting the emergency services to the Grenfell Tower fire. It's the fourth floor. Right, okay. Quick, 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 quick. They're on their it's way burning. already. Yes, I know it's burning, but they are on their way. You've only just called, as long as you're okay. Yeah? The sheer numbers were incredible. 72 deaths. More than 250 firefighters and 70 fire engines were involved. More than 100 London ambulance crews attended. The fire in the tower burned for 60 hours before it was finally put out, leaving a black, hulking wreck. It seemed unprecedented. But residents said they had been warning for years about possible problems. And my name's Eddie Daffron. I wrapped a towel, a wet towel around my face, and then I ran out of my door. That was Eddie Daffron on the morning of the fire. He'd escaped from the 16th floor. As part of the Grenfell Residence Group, he'd warned about potential safety problems. In particular, he wrote a blog in 2016, presently titled Playing With Fire, where he cautioned that a fire could happen. So why weren't he and other residents listened to? People are, want answers, and it's absolutely right. And that's why I am today ordering a full public inquiry into this disaster. We need to know what happened. We need to know, have an explanation of this. We owe that to the families, to the people who have lost loved ones, friends, and the homes in which they lived. The then Prime Minister, Theresa May, announcing a public inquiry. It didn't stop anger being shown towards her when she returned to Grenfell a second time, having failed to meet survivors the first time she went. And that anger continued to be felt by many that the residents had not been listened to and lessons had not been learned. By the Brit Awards of February 2018, the rap artist Stormzy articulated much of the frustration that many felt about whether those in Grenfell had been ignored because of race and class. Well, you fool, we just forgot about Grenfell, you criminals. And you've got the truth to call us savages. You should do some jail time. You should pay some damages. You should burn your house down and see if you can manage this. And please leave coal, which is smoke a bit of In May 2018, the Grenfell Inquiry heard harrowing testimony of those who had lost loved ones. Nine-year-old Sarah Shabuni had lost her young cousin and playmate, Matthew. Mehdi and I both live in Grenfell Tower. Had he lived until adulthood, I think he would have liked to have been a comedian. I will miss Mehdi in a lot and I will never forget him. The inquiry was divided into two phases. The first dealt with what happened on the night of the fire. The second, wider events. Phase one, which reported last year, found that the cladding used on the tower was the principal reason that the fire spread and that while individual firefighters had showed courage and dedication, London Fire Brigade's policy of advising tenants to stay put had ended up costing lives. Phase two is still ongoing. Grenfell was a terrible tragedy, but what became increasingly clear was that Grenfell was not a one-off. While much of the media coverage in the immediate aftermath rightly focused on the suffering of those there, some journalists and experts began to ask about how much more widespread the problems might be for those living in social housing and beyond. This is the story we tell today. What we've got here are potentially thousands and thousands of buildings with obviously many more residents living in them that are unsafe. I think it's incredibly depressing, to be honest, that three years on we're still having to talk about this in terms of there's not been much progress. Welcome to the Know How Podcast special five-part series, Reporting Injustice. This is a series where we look at some of the key stories in recent years that were turning points in how we saw some fundamental issues. We talked to the journalists who uncovered them about their struggles to bring these stories to public view. And we speak to experts who explain how these reports altered the way society perceived pressing matters of race, class and sexism. From Windrush to Bill Cosby, Grenfell to missing and murdered Indigenous women, Reporting Injustice looks at the stories behind the stories.
In this episode, we're looking at the Grenfell Tower fire of 2017, in which 72 people died. It was the worst residential fire in Britain since the Second World War. The initial cause had been a malfunctioning fridge freezer in a fourth floor flat, but the spread of the fire was due to the type of cladding and insulation that made the flames extend so rapidly. While the media rushed to report the disaster itself, it was a specialist publication, Inside Housing, which used freedom of information requests to reveal how the Grenfell disaster was far from a one-off. We're also going to look at how council tenants were ignored, and how the investigations have shown these safety issues go far beyond social housing alone. Sophie Barnes was working at Inside Housing, looking at the issue of fire safety. We were always for a long time writing about kind of fire safety alongside all the other issues of social housing but it was probably Lackanell House, um, the fire at Lackanell House in South London that made us kind of sit up and really focus on the, the issue of fire safety within these tower blocks. It's been described by the London Fire Brigade as a unique fire. It's certainly one of the worst in peacetime London. This wasn't actually Grenfell. This was a house fire in Southwark in which six people died in 2009 and where subsequent inquiries suggested there might be problems with cladding and lack of fire breaks. Sophie Barnes explains the previous warnings that there had been there before Grenfell. There was an expert called Sam Webb who is an architect that has been amazing basically at pushing for years and years about the issues of fire safety and really campaigning um, to try and sort out this issue and he'd said to me there's a real issue with the type of cladding that's on these buildings we need to sort it out and he'd warned you know there's going, there's going to be other fires like this unless we look at it. Inside Housing also broke the story that following a fire in Shepherd's Bush the London Fire Brigade had written to all London councils warning them of the dangers to buildings from outside material however this was not taken up by the national media. For us, it was frustrating because we were in that world. And so we kept seeing these tower block fires and we kept seeing these issues with cladding and with safety issues. And we were seeing a pattern. But I think if you're a national newspaper journalist, well, it was just a case of you've got a general news reporter covering a, covering a one-off fire, then another general news reporter covering another one-off fire. So you, we wouldn't necessarily join the dots. Martin Hilditch, the then editor of Inside Housing, pushed his team to keep following these stories and join the dots. It was something his reporters agreed with. If you just think about the number of people affected, so say one tower block, you might have a thousand people living in that tower block. So therefore, if there's an issue with the fire safety there, that's a thousand people who potentially their lives are in danger. And then I just think, I think maybe... For us, it was that we were always very in, interested in looking at, you know, social housing tenants and, you know, the voice they have, the, the impact they are able to have um, if they're listened to. And we did so many stories about people living in damp, horrible flats. In the aftermath of the tragedy, it may seem difficult to understand why Grenfell was such a popular place to live before that. It was a highly sought after block. Jill Kernick, a safety culture and leadership expert, lived there from 2011 to 2014. I'd just come back from traveling and wasn't ready to buy and was looking for somewhere to rent. And frankly, value for money. It was brilliant in this area because this is one of the most expensive areas in London. Saw it advertised. It was really reasonable, huge flat. Walked in and absolutely fell in love with it. Grenfell was mainly social housing, although there were a few private tenants there as well. But what was significant was that there had been concerns raised about safety in the tower, most notably in a blog made by tenants. But this had not been picked up by the media. Sophie Barnes. So, and I know that there's been quite a bit of talk in, in terms of Grenfell Tower, in terms of if there had been a better local newspaper presence, if that would have been picked up. I imagine, yes, it would have been picked up because that's exactly the type of thing that local, local newspapers are very good at is taking on a local cause and really kind of championing it and, and campaigning really to, to get things sorted out. That's going, they need to get up there, that's what they're doing. The whole block's gone. The fire broke out on the 14th of June 2017 in the early hours. 
Sophie Barnes reflects on what she remembers of that day. I ended up going down to the site that same day to report on what was happening. Um, people were just completely confused and lost and devastated because they lost their homes. And, you know, I think everyone was just in a, a huge state of shock. Um, there was still material from the fire, which could have been the cladding, I guess, that was blowing in the wind, so people were wearing masks. It was... Uh, it was just a bit overwhelming. It was just, it was completely shocking. For Jill Koenig, it was almost unbearable to watch, given the happy times she had spent living in the tower. The memories I have is of the, the views and of the sounds of kids playing. And it's a community like any community. I mean, I, we didn't have lots of close friends. We weren't there for a long time. But you'd say hi to everybody. You'd take parcels for your neighbours. You know, you chat to people in the lifts. What I love about high rises is you kind of like you see people growing. You see the kids and then they get older and I love that. I am going to be joined now by the singer Lily Allen. She lives in this area and is well known amongst the local community and knows a fair amount about the background to this whole issue. Lily Allen, uh, what's your sense of what a public inquiry should be looking at? Um, well, I think that there needs to be questions answered about fire regulations. The eyes of the world were suddenly on Grenfell. The Prime Minister, Theresa May, was booed when she came to meet victims. The mainstream media found celebrities like Lily Allen on the ground willing to give their verdicts. There were camera crews galore wanting to talk about the disaster that had just happened and cover what was happening to survivors. For Sophie Barnes, however, equally important were the deeper questions that were raised. So I think we, we quite early on sat down and thought, what can we do? We decided quite early on that we were obviously experts in this area compared to other journalists. And so we had to really make the most of that by focusing on the policy failures going back years, um, the, the kind of nitty gritty details of what exactly was on the tower and why was it, how was it put in place. Because of the previous stories that had been written, Barnes knew that the cladding that had caused the problems at Grenfell was unlikely to be confined to just one tower. So while many journalists were focused on the immediate aftermath, Barnes approached every council in the country to see how widespread problems with fire safety were. I sent a freedom of information request to every council in the country asking uh, for all the fire uh, risk assessments for their council tower blocks and got a, a, a large number back, I think about 30% of the total social housing stock in the country in terms of tower blocks. And just uh, going through those and tallying up all the issues was really alarming. That was a bit of a wake up call, I think, in terms of this isn't, Grenfell was obviously a horrific example, but it was a horrific example of a much wider problem. The problem at Grenfell was with what was called aluminium composite material, or ACM, cladding. But that was not the only issue it emerged. Another type of cladding called high-pressure laminate, or HPL, was also something that could be a fire risk. Finally, many buildings had problems with absence of cavity barriers. A large part of the failures, I think, in, in leading up to Grenfell were, was this huge focus on deregulation. And the, you know the the bonfire of red tape and and um, this almost kind of fixation really on we, getting rid of these regulations too much regulation it stifles innovation and you know maybe that's fair enough in certain um, industries and certain kind of government departments but when it comes to housing and safety and fire safety it seems crazy you know these these regulations are in place for a reason it quickly became clear that many more people were facing a potential safety risk. Susan Bright is a professor of land law at New College, Oxford. What we've got here are potentially thousands and thousands of buildings with obviously many more residents living in them that are unsafe. So the, in terms of the question of how many people are affected, sometimes figures of like 50,000 people are used, but it's probably much more realistic to still think of well over half a million people who are affected by this. Behind this lay, as it often does, the issue of money. As the widespread dangers became apparent, it started to encompass private tenants as well who'd bought their flats. Susan Bright again. So you'd, you'd think that there'd be a fairly easy legal answer to that as to how you could make your, your building safe. 
but actually it's really complex and and, and, and and it comes down essentially to I think two different issues. One issue is who has the power in the sense of the legal ability to actually make the building safe and the other issue is who's going to pay for it um, and they're two separate but both fundamentally important questions. To answer that you have to start then looking at our system of property ownership and how we sell flats um, in, in England. In England, most people who buy flats buy a leasehold. That is a lease on a unit in a bigger building. The freeholder is the one who owns the whole building. So the only person who's got the power in the sense of legal powers to actually do anything to alter that physical structure of the building, which is the bit that needs to be made safe, is the freeholder. And you would think it would be intuitive that, of course, the people living in the building would have the legal ability to force the freeholder to make the building safe, but they don't. And then we move on to the second issue, which is if the freeholder does choose to make the building safe, then the question is who's going to pay the bill. Um, and under the majority of leases, the costs of making the building safe will be passed on to the leaseholders. So what you end up with is a problem that the people who bought flats in all innocence, assuming that they will be safe, end up having to foot the bill for making the building safe. And we're talking about bills that can be five-figure sums. The government did announce a fund for ACM cladding buildings just before the second anniversary of Grenfell. And more recently, they announced a fund for non-ACM buildings. Susan Bright thinks this will not be enough. Meanwhile, Jill Kanick points out that social housing tenants were just ignored for too long. So you're going in with the view residents are going to be difficult. We shouldn't, yeah. you know, we should control what we hear for them. We should, you know, in some way silence them. So it's, that's why they weren't listened to. And I don't think this is specific to Grenfell. I think that's common, is we all silence other voices. You know, not silencing other voices is a, an act of leadership and it takes a lot of work. A lack of local media has meant that many of these stories have gone ignored in the press. But Bright points out that social media has allowed those caught up in buildings with safety problems a voice. The, the role of social media has been so fundamentally important here because it's enabled those isolated buildings to come together and have a collective voice, which has been much more powerful. In particular, there were two campaign groups formed. One was called UK Cladding Action Group, and that was formed by three individual people who just got together um, and has become a really powerful voice now in this space. Um, and the other was called um, the Manchester Cladiator Group because Manchester has been very badly affected by this. They've got, I don't know, approaching almost 100 buildings, I think. It's now more than three years on since the Grenfell disaster. The Grenfell inquiry recently restarted 28 months after it began, although hearings look set to continue into 2022. We asked all our guests to reflect what had happened since then. Jill Koenig. We've learned some piecemeal lessons, so we'll change some regulations, but I don't think we think about how mindsets need to change. How many more voices are heard? after Grenfell. How much has that mindset of othering shifted? I don't think we've learned. For Bright, there is still a big problem. Many people are unable to sell their flats, which may or may not have safety issues, because all flats which are sold must have an external wall survey, or EWS. But there simply aren't enough professionals to do these surveys in a timely manner. The stories are that some of these buildings are going to have to wait years before they can get an EWS form, simply to show the building is safe. It's not even that we're focusing on unsafe buildings now. And so this, you know, the problem is, is, is an extraordinary problem. It's just like a can of worms. It just keeps getting, you know, it's escalating all the time, the ramifications of this. And finally, Sophie Barnes, who, with the team at Inside Housing, pursued the story to prove that this was not just a one-off tragedy, which was unavoidable. What's her verdict three years down the line? I think it's incredibly depressing, to be honest, that three years on, we're still having to talk about this in terms of there's not been much progress. Um, I was really hoping, I really thought, honestly, that within a year after Grenfell, all this cladding would have come off these buildings because I thought if this isn't a wake up call, then what is really, you know, 72 lives lost? What, what more do we need? Thank you for listening to The Know How and the third in our special series, Reporting Injustice. 
It was presented by Dr. Glenda Cooper and Dr. Lindsay Blumel and produced by Tina Dimitrova. For more information, please go to our website, theknowhowpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter at Know Podcast or on Facebook at The Know How Podcast. In our next episode... The most shocking one was that this woman who was being her police officer partner was abusive to both her and the children and they said that the the, the father had tried to suffocate and strangle them but the police did nothing about it they did nothing to follow up on it there was no evidence in any of the police and that was just to me that was really shocking we look at how domestic abuse by police officers often went unpunished until a journalist helped set off change in the system.